So then officially welcome everyone. We are very excited to welcome you to the session tonight on building a powerful brand in a cross-cultural and virtual environment. And tonight we want to speak about how you can really be your authentic self in the workspace, how you can embrace your own identity and your own story with confidence and pride, while also fostering diversity and inclusion and also thriving in spite of COVID. And we could not be more thrilled um, than having Mita Malik here tonight. She's perfect. She's the perfect expert for this topic. She's currently in head of inclusion at a technology company, Carta. She used to be the head of diversity at Unilever in the US. And Leslie will introduce her in much more detail in just a second. Just to tell you as so much, she is a really passionate diversity advocate and really good storyteller with a tremendous track record of transforming businesses and brands and cultures. Now, a few housekeeping rules, as we're quite a few people here, um, we really want to make the session as interactive as possible. So please do not hesitate to ask your questions throughout the session by typing your questions in the question box. And then also in the very end, we would like to um, open the floor and the mic. So then you will also have the chance to actually um, post your question um, or your comment orally. Um, now, also before we get started, very brief introduction. I want to let you know it's a very special session because it's co-organized by the Beijing Women's Network and Unleashed Today. And Unleashed Today, for those that don't know us just yet, um, it's a passion project that was started by Kate Sorala, my friend who's a lawyer in London, and myself. I used to work as a policy advocate in Brussels and moved here to Beijing earlier this year. And the two of us um, succeeded in our professional career very quickly, but faced a lot of challenges on the way. And last year we got together and said, hey, we want to really share our lessons learned and help other young ambitious women to unleash their potential in the workspace. We are now a team of 20 people working very diligently towards the launch of our first book, which will come out early next year. We also have weekly webinars just like this one, um, where we talk about topics such as confidence building, overcoming perfectionism, networking, mental health, etc. And if you want to know more about us, please follow us on unleashedtoday.com or also for those in China, of course, join our WeChat um, a group and um, I'll share further information later. And Mita Malik is one of our experts that actually shares the story in our book. But enough oh, about us. Cool. Leslie, tell us more about the Beijing Women's Network. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, um, Sarah. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. For those of you that don't know about the Beijing Women's Network, um, I'm, I'm the co-president. And our story is actually really similar to what Sarah was saying about how we started. Uh, we started about five years ago, um, and it was just a group of a uh, few women, professional women in China that decided just to get together one night, just to have dinner and drinks, just to hang out. Um, but to their astonishment, that even though they are all from different places, um, some were from the United States, some was from Spain, one was from China, um, they all studied different things. They worked in different industries, um, but as they sat together over the dinner, they realized that they faced all the same challenges and the same pressures simply because they were women. Like they didn't know necessarily how to suddenly become confident in the workplace, how to challenge their bosses. They didn't know how to negotiate their salary. And they also didn't know how to plan out their lives in case they wanted to have a family um, and how they could have a family There you go. Um, and as a result, they decided that they wanted to get together uh, and create a network that will help other women that were, you know, that face the same challenges. And since then, we've grown from a network of five, six women to over five, uh, 5,000 professional women in Beijing. And we run five different WeChat groups and we run regular events uh, just to help connect other women 
uh, to resources that can help them grow personally and professionally. So if you are not yet a part of the network, um, please make sure you stay tuned um, till after the webinar and I can share some information about how to join. And you don't need to know how to speak Chinese in order to join. So we welcome both Chinese and international women. All right, so enough about me. Now this is the moment that we've all been waiting for, for the, for a while now and for me, especially for the last few weeks. I'm super excited to introduce to you all Mita Malik. Um, she's a head of inclusion, equity and impact at Carta um, and the former head of diversity, inclusion and cross-cultural marketing at Unilever. Um, under her leadership, Unilever was named the number one company for working moms by Working Mom Media in 2018 and rated the second best employer for women in 2020 by Forbes. And she herself has received a whole bunch of honors and awards, including the inaugural Diversity Innovator Award from the National Association of Female Executives. Um, so super excited to have her today. Uh, and to start off this conversation, Mita, I wanna ask you actually a little bit about your work. So whether it's at your work at Unilever or Carta, you actually have a lot of words in your title uh, and they're big words too. So can you tell us a little bit about what your work actually entails and what inspired you to get into this type of work? Sure, well, uh, thank you, Leslie and Sarah for having me. Um, really nice to see all of you. I'm calling from Jersey City, New Jersey, right across the river from Manhattan. That's where I'm zooming in from here with my coffee. And I always say we're all in different journeys in our pandemic globally. We're week 40 here, day one. Leslie and Sarah will Oh, wow. I, yes, yeah. we recorded I've been counting. So that's when we started working remotely. I have a five and eight year old. Um, they've been instructed to watch TV quietly and get ready for school <laughs> while we all have our chat. Uh, and so uh, where can I begin? Let me talk to you about the titles and then please let's, you know, ask me some more questions about my uh, background and upbringing and we can, we can go from there. So I also switched jobs during a pandemic a global pandemic, which I don't think anyone ever thinks they'll do, but I did. Um, so I'm week six into my new job. So I was formerly the head of inclusion and cross-cultural marketing at Unilever. So what does inclusion mean? I think when you think of all these words, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging is a new one, is that we all want to be recognized and valued for the work we do. We spend too much time at work now over Zoom for many of us, but that we want to feel like we can bring the best versions of ourselves to work. Um, diversity I define as we all have unique identities and abilities and life experiences we bring. Inclusion is when we're at work, do we feel like it's a psychologically safe place? If I speak up, will my voice be heard and will my, my ideas be recognized? And um, cross-cultural marketing is this idea yeah. of inclus inclusive design, right? So we talk about workforce a lot and we talk about how diverse is the workforce? Is it inclusive? But what about inclusive design? So what do I mean by that? We all have different skin needs, hair needs. Uh, mm. If I, um, and this is something I've been working on to try to get empathy. If I didn't have use of my right arm, what would it be like for me to dress in the morning? I likely would need magnetic buttons, right? So thinking about that from all the different life experiences, like how do you create products for that? And then the final word I'll talk about is equity. And equity is really that we don't all start from the same, same place, right? And in the US, the example I would give is the history of um, slavery and the institution of slavery. And so knowing about that institution and knowing how it's impacted the black African-American community uh, mm. You can understand that not all communities start from the same point of equity. That's also true for women and men. So that's my little 101 on diversity. And that is so amazing. I think that we've really come a long way and we still obviously have a long way to go. But I think a career, a position like that just didn't necessarily exist a few decades ago. And, and for there to be recognition of this type of work um, shows that there's increasing awareness and importance of having everyone represented, not just culturally, but also represented through products and through um, services that are tailored to different people with different needs, um, which is incredible. And I think that's something that's happening in China as well. Although we, I don't know if we necessarily have similar words yet defined um, that place of value on all these things, but there is definitely an increase in awareness of diversity and doyuanhua. Um, so 
this is just so empowering just to start having these conversations and especially around women. Um, but back to cross-cultural branding. Um, when we talk about branding, one of the things that always comes to mind for me is that you need to be comfortable in putting yourself out there um, in order to, um, to really make a name for yourself or a brand for yourself. Um, but I think that women, um, especially for women, it's we often suffer from not having, having a lack of confidence or being really shy and uncomfortable of raising our voices. Uh, and I remember conversations we had previously. Uh, Mita, you said that you used to be painfully shy as a child, which is just so hard to believe. Um, so can you, can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing and how you overcame the shyness and what advice you would have for women? I should have invited my mother and brother to the talk because they're the <laughs> only two people in my life that believe that I was painfully shy. And my father, um, God bless him, we lost him a few years ago. So, but you know, he, like I was painfully shy and I think that's different than introverted, being introverted. So my background is I'm mm -hmm. proud of being immigrant parents. I, my, my younger brother and I were born and raised in the US. And I actually don't think I was born painfully shy. I think I was, there's a term called ambivert, which I've embraced. It's a new term, but it's a mix of an extrovert and an introvert. I do oh, think wow. I was more an extrovert, but I do mm -hmm. think my upbringing actually created, um, you know, made me painfully shy. And I grew up outside of Boston. We were um, three families of color. It was quite a homogenous neighborhood. And I was um, the dark skinned, funny looking girl with the funny looking braid whose parents would have had a funny accent. They would drop yeah. us off in a funny looking van, van that played funny looking music until it wasn't funny anymore, right? right. And that's, the, that's when it becomes really dark and that's the dark side of bullying. And I was bullied both um, heavily uh, physically and verbally growing up. Oh. And so there was a lot of name calling throwing things at me. There was racial slurs that was that were spray painted in front of our home and our driveway. And at the time when I was young, I didn't know what they meant. And my parents actually couldn't afford to repave our driveway. So the words just stayed there for a very long time until oh, yeah. the winter came and washed them away. And then I think the most formative experience I had was my freshman year in high school, which is ninth grade, where the bullying in that class had gotten to an extreme and it was an intro to physical science class. I loved science. I was really into lab. And these two uh, white boys had decided to set my hair on fire that day. In oh class. my gosh. Um, and so my hair was actually uh, like in many, many women do in Indian culture, it was down to my knees traditionally in a braid. So they kept mm -hmm. lighting matches um, and throwing them into my hair from behind me, which I didn't know. And my lab partner who never spoke to me until that day said, your hair is on fire. And so it was probably, I think one of the most formative things that happened in my life, my early life. And it was actually the first time in my life that someone stood up for me as an advocate. And it was the guidance counselor. So those two boys were suspended for a day mm -hmm. uh, and they were sent back to school, which also there's a lot of trauma in that when the individuals who have been bullying you or perpetrators come back to your, your space. But he yeah. was the first person who actually took me under my wing. I am not coordinated as my husband and children will tell you, but I run really fast. And so that guidance counselor was also the varsity track coach and recognized that. And sports mm. for me were a really great equalizer. And so by doing sports and, and, and feeling like I was being treated equal on the field, I actually started to slowly rebuild my confidence. What I would say to you as I look at that experience years later is that I, for years, sort of like ex-boyfriends would, would Google the bullies and wonder what they were up to and had a lot of anger about how mm -hmm. they've been growing up. But I realize mm -hmm. now my anger was misplaced. And as a parent now, I think about where were all the parents, where were the teachers, where was law enforcement? And I think this happens in our organizations all the time as well. Right. Yeah. So we yeah. all have a responsibility to stand up for each other. Uh, I'll pause there, but also, um, you know, as you can imagine, I share that very openly now because it gives people an understanding when I say painfully shy, 
mm-hmm. they really understand why I was painfully shy and how much work it took for me to really find my voice after that. Right, exactly. And may I ask, um, how did you then, in spite of these really difficult experiences now nowadays, where, how did you uh, manage to develop so much confidence and learn to turn this apparent weakness, as it, perhaps as you might have perceived it before, turn into a strength? Because now you're very proud to have a diverse background, an Indian background. You speak so openly about it. You share your stories. Um, how did you learn to, to be your authentic self? It took time and it took a lot of practice. So I had trouble making eye contact with people. And I would tell you, what I shared with you was just one experience. So a lot of things had happened to me over the course of being a child and young adult and just you know persistent bullying. And that I think really um, can have a devastating sense of self, devastating effect on your confidence. If you all haven't read the book, Politics Aside, Michelle Obama's book, Becoming, she oh, talks. Yes. I, mm-hmm. I hate the word microaggressions because what's the opposite? Macroaggressions. It's just everyday aggressions, everyday mm-hmm. slights that women face. And it happens every single day, like little paper cuts, and you don't even mm-hmm. notice. And then all of a sudden mm-hmm. you wake up one morning and your confidence is shot. Yeah. And so I would say I had I had trouble in groups of five or six speaking up throughout graduate school. I sat in the back of my class. I did not raise my hand. I always got the, tw- the, the 10% dinged off because I never participated. I was so nervous in my confidence, but I really wanted to lead. I was very passionate about joining a company and this was something that was really important to me. And I'll share with you another experience I had and tie it back to steps and practical things we can talk about that I did. But I was at Johnson & Johnson, I'll say the name of the company now, but it was very early in my career. So excited to be there. And I worked really hard to get a full-time offer after I graduated from um, university, from grad school. And I was there eight months. I thought I was killing it. I was like really excited. And I'll never forget the day my manager impromptu, he was wearing like this ugly Hawaiian, Hawaiian print t-shirt, I'll never forget. He pulls me into an office. They just come out of talent calibration. And he's like, listen, I need to give you some feedback. No one knows what you do here. You are a wallflower. You're in meetings, you don't speak up. Um, you don't use your voice, you're not going to be a manager here, never mind a director. So at the time, the company was really focused. They hired people who could get to director level. This person's telling me, I can't even get to manager, never mind director. And I remember coming home that night bawling, having like a pint of Ben and Jerry's, like devastated because I saw myself as a leader and I can't believe he's telling me that I don't speak up and I like, no one knows what I'm doing when I'm working my butt off. And you know what? The truth is once I slept on it, he was right. He was not the best boss for me, but I would say that his feedback was really critical in me thinking about how I could actually start to use my voice and show up in meetings. And I did end up leaving that company, but that was a really critical point in my career. So one of the few, one of the things I started to do, and then I'll pause so Sarah Leslie, you can um, react and ask me some more questions. But I think for me, like using my voice was practice. So it was really, it started simply as a a senior leader once told me, if you've been invited to a meeting, you have a responsibility to speak up, right? Somebody has invited you to this meeting because they feel like you can add value. So as I, today's Monday, right? On Sunday nights, I would be looking at my calendar and thinking about what are the meetings I'm gonna go to? A lot of companies send pre-reads, which is really helpful. Or if you know what the topic is, to read the material. And sometimes it's really difficult to state your opinion at first, but always ask a question. That's a really good way to show people that you're engaged because I would always be the person in the back of the classroom and back of the classroom, back of the meeting, typing away. I was very engaged. It was not that I was like, you know, shopping online or something. I was like typing notes. I was like, but I was really scared to like put out my perspective but asking a question is a really good way to start practicing your voice and I always say be the first one to ask the question and I still do if I'm in senior meetings I'm the first one to ask the question I still get nervous but if you ask the question first it actually helps with nerves I find Mm. like you break through the initial barrier and it just becomes a little bit easier to, to continue contributing 
Yeah, that, that's really good advice. I'll definitely write that one down. <laughs> Um, another thing that kind of came to my mind as you were speaking, Nita, was about not just opening up and sharing your voice, uh, but also knowing when to um, initiate difficult conversations. Like when you're challenging your boss uh, on an opinion of something um, or, per or pitching an idea that may not be very popular um, immediately, but you really see merit in that um, and being comfortable being different. Do you have any advice when it comes to to speaking up and uh, in a in moments when you're deeply uncomfortable and you know that you're kind of shaking up kind of status quo? That's a great question. I'm week six or seven now. I lost count. Week seven into a new job, and so I'm sort of going through that process again of finding stakeholders and advocates and building a strategy and getting people on board and making people perhaps a bit uncomfortable because this is new work in this organization. So mm -hmm. always, I mean, listen, I think the biggest piece of advice I can give everyone on this um, seminar today is what I've been telling myself is that somebody is paying you for your opinion. And all of a sudden, if I feel like I'm letting someone down, it shifts for me, right? So it's no yeah. longer about me being scared to use my voice, but people are relying on me for my expertise. And so, you know, always be true to your personality. I'm not combative. I'm not argumentative. I always joke, that's my husband. He should have been a lawyer. He's very, he's very good. That's not me, right? So right. I'll put my opinion out. Have you considered this? Or I'm really passionate about this, right? I think put your opinion out there. I think number two, make sure you have facts aligned with the story or some data points, mm. right? So if you have a very different perspective, but a very different perspective, Leslie, than what you put out there, great. Here's another solution. Here's why, A, B, and C. So make sure that it is um, less emotional. And it might be, listen, we all get passionate about things, right? But let's try to also have the facts and the story. And then number three, I think a really great way to get people to change their minds is when you have other people saying what you think as well. So right. <laughs> try to also get advocates behind the scenes. So if your boss isn't quite there or your peer isn't quite there, go and socialize the idea with other people and get their help mm -hmm. and advice and make the idea stronger. Right. Now you mentioned several times the importance of raising your voice, right? And then finding your voice. And in the physical world, I guess you can do it, as you say, by sitting at the table, um, raising your hand, speaking yeah. up, being, being present. Right. Now, now it's COVID time and in, in yes. China, things are getting uh, normal again, but as you just described yourself, you're on home office, you're at home with your family. Would you have any tips as to how you can actually find your voice in a virtual world? Because it's so easy to just, you know, put yourself on mute, sit there, listen to what's happening um, and not be present at all. And I, I can imagine that very easily you can be forgotten as, as, as a colleague or active, active, yeah, active member of the, of the team. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought this point up. I think the thing that I'm the most concerned about, we're seeing in the headlines in the US in particular, women leaving uh, the workforce in droves. We've lost, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic in February, the recent stat is 2 million women have left the workforce. We are in danger oh, wow. of being behind by, you know, a generation if we don't quickly, um, you know, revert back and try to think of what, how we can do, what we can do to better support women. So, you know, for many of us as we're working, I think the thing that worries me the most about women in our organizations is exactly what you said. I can put my camera off, I can stay on mute, and it was like I was never in a meeting and I can disappear off the radar of my organization. And, and so that is incredibly frightening to me, right? So one of the things, you know, the tips I would give is, um, you know, be camera ready. And I know that's really difficult because we all have children and balancing, but as somebody senior, if my kids come in now, and this is like a webinar workshop we're doing together. But if they come in, this is the soundtrack of our lives, right? Mm -hmm. They come in, they come in. They come into meetings. I presented at a town hall in front of 10,000 people. I had my daughter in my lap because it just, she wasn't in school. What are you going to do? Everyone understands. Yeah. And I'm not going to apologize for it. So I mm -hmm. think be camera ready. 
And if your pets, your partner, your children show up, it's okay. Don't let it phase you, just continue on. You know, also there are inequity issues, right? Some people, but depending on their background or where they live or their hair or how they're looking or feeling that day, they don't want their camera in, on and that's okay. But as leaders, we have to make sure when we have meetings to make sure it says camera on. And then also as individuals, think about your week and think about the meetings where there are career defining moments and you want your camera on, right? Like if you're in a one-on-one -on -one with your boss or you're presenting to senior leadership, make sure your camera is ready. Um, the second piece of advice I would give, many of us are using Zoom, use the chat function, right? Because that's a wonderful way, you know, as a leader, every meeting should have a strong facilitator, just like we have Leslie and Sarah today to make sure they draw out the questions and they're hearing all the voices. If you can't get your word in because of everybody interrupting and people not knowing when to speak, use the chat function. And then as a facilitator, I would say, use the, um, I don't think we have it here, but I know in um, Microsoft Teams, there's a function where you can raise your hand um, or on chat, you can say the facilitator will come back. Um, and then the last piece of advice I'll, I'll leave is be intentional with connecting with people. Because I think mm -hmm. even as somebody who is a career sponsor for so many women and men, when I was back at my old job, seven weeks into the pandemic, I was like, I haven't met with all these senior leaders in so long. And because it would be, well, I know I would go get coffee with that person, or we would bump into each other, have, have lunch, or we would grab a drink after work. You have to be so intentional about, as somebody who's looking after someone's career, checking in on them. And also, if you have a senior leader who was coaching you, just put on time on their calendar to get a virtual cup of tea. So to all the ladies here in the chat, turn on your camera and ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. This is the perfect time to practice for sure. Um, we actually have a question from the audience right now from CD. Um, she says, what would you do if your boss at first was liking you and kept on praising you? And after some months passed, your boss suddenly keeps on finding the negativity from you and, and is always pinpointing saying that you're not performing. What would you do and how would you react? Thanks for um, sharing so vulnerably. That's really difficult. And I've been in that situation. I'm, I'm sure many women on this call can relate. I think there, there's a few approaches. One, it sounds like at some point the trust was there. So can you pinpoint where the trust might have been broken between the two of you? Might be likely for you when the feedback started negatively versus the fact that you were really on a, he was giving you positive, he or she or they were giving you positive feedback. If you can, so sort of pinpoint that and think about at what point did it turn? Was there a certain event or a certain thing that happened where your relationship started to change? I think the second thing is to be courageous and vulnerable and use your voice and have a conversation with your boss to say, I just wanted to open this conversation up. I really enjoy working here. I really appreciate working for you, your coaching advice, love the team. I'm wondering what has changed because for me, I feel like in the beginning, I was performing really well, getting great feedback from you. In the last few months, here's how I've been feeling, right? So all you can do is your own, own your own, own own your own emotions and the impact that's been felt, but ask them and give specific examples. Like, again, I think the emotion can, can be useful and important so they know how you feel, but what are the specific things that have happened? And do you think that feedback is fair? So I think the other piece is self-awareness. Mm -hmm. Have things changed for you personally and, and professionally, and is the feedback fair? And then the last piece I will tell you is Everyone deserves to be somewhere where they're celebrated and not tolerated. And that's something mm -hmm. I'm tr trying to live by. We all have such amazing, unique talents and capabilities. You all deserve that. I deserve that. We deserve that. And so if it's no longer a place for you, then that's a, a consideration you have to make. If the feedback is unfair, then it might be time at some point for you to look for another opportunity. Mm. Yeah, I really like that quote. It, it like kind of rhymed too. It's, you want to be in yeah, a place somebody, that you're celebrated, I, <laughs> not, celebrated tolerated. not tolerated. I, somebody, I was on a panel months ago. Someone said it. I can't figure out who it was. <laughs> so don't attribute, you can attribute it to me, but 
that person is out there. I bet yeah, if I we'll Google celebrate it, that person too. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I think that 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 actually helps um, bring up another point I thought of too. Um, it's not we deal with different cultures wherever we're living in. Um, so sometimes it's a company culture that we come and clash with, um, but so oftentimes it's your own. It's different cultures um, that you're operating in. Uh, so for example, for me, uh, a bit like Mita, but I'm Chinese American. Uh, so my mom's from Taiwan and my dad's from Hong Kong. Grew up in the States, but I work in China. Uh, and so I think Mita probably has a lot of experience with this too, that you you are born in a way um, and you're living in a, in a time that's just so globally connected that you're in that intersection of all these different cultural identities. Um, and oftentimes those cultural values and identities clash with each other. Um, and that can happen in a global workplace as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it does disproportionately affect women because in addition to having to overcome the barriers of being a woman and confidence gaps, you then have to learn how to, to be authentic to yourself while being culturally sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, and so do you, can you share any experiences that you've had Mina, where you've had to kind of reckon with being Indian and American um, and having to figure out how to be a to both, but still having your voice heard? It's a great point. It's something I'm still struggling with as an adult many years later. So I, I mentioned earlier, I was in the child of immigrant parents from India. My parents, I would say on the scale were pretty liberal, but they were incredibly focused on education. In our home, my brother and I were treated equally, but I think there are subtle things that you don't even realize. So there's the whole first sort of premise of children are to be seen, not to be heard. There's a second mm -hmm. kind of premise of you don't question authority. You don't question the aunties or uncles. You don't question anyone, right? Who's in, who's yeah. in a position of authority. And then I th think the third piece is, is being raised a Hindu. There is this subtle sort of thread throughout your life of when you were born as a woman, you were in the care of your father. And then if you're lucky enough and God, you should get married, then you're in the care of your husband. And God forbid your husband dies before you, you better hope you have a son because now you're in the care of him. So it's this subtle sort of thread, um, mm -hmm. I would say of differ differential, being differential, right? Or being in the care of somebody. And then all of a sudden you want to be in corporate America and you're in a meeting with us, your CEO and you are trying to defend your point of view. And we don't talk about this enough, but all of a sudden 18 years plus of upbringing that's in, in cultural, this is a part of who I am. And then all of yeah. a sudden I'm in corporate America and it just actually goes against the things and how I was raised to behave, behave whether it's right, wrong or not. And so I think, again, I go back to the fact that I was hired for a reason. I get a paycheck for a reason. People depend on me. I have expertise. And so when I flip mm -hmm. it that way, I can do it in a way that's authentic to me. I can do mm -hmm. it with a smile. I can do it with a joke. I can do it in however I feel comfortable um, presenting a different point of view. Yeah. Very well said. Thanks so much, Mita. Um, I actually wanted to come back to this topic of personal branding, particularly in the onward world. And I just see there's also a question that is very much related to this. Um, because actually, Leslie and I, we never met you in person, right? We yeah. uh, found out about you by reading articles, um, f seeing your comments on LinkedIn. So we got in touch with you, um, which shows that you are very good at personal online branding. Um, and I would firstly really be interested in hearing a bit more about how intentional are you? Are you just do you just like share your opinion? Do you really sit down every day and say, hey, today I need to write an article so people hear about me, people don't forget about me? Um, would you have any tips for the people listening as to how they can actually work on their personal brand, particularly in this on-world world? Um, and also perhaps a personal comment, I think very often women in particular see branding as something negative. They think selling yourself is, is, is negative. Mm -hmm showing off is something you that you should not um, aspire to do um, whereas I personally think it's it's about a mindset uh, mindset shift because if you if you're not able to speak about yourself with pride and confidence then um, yeah who then what then you, you will not be able to get further 
Um, and in this regard, I, I see Charlotte wrote also a question. What advice do you have about building a powerful business brand with a compelling brand story? But I guess you can also build your personal brand yeah, if you see absolutely. yourself as a business, right? So I think, thank you for that question. I think it's a really important question. And I think in, the, in these times when we're all, all online and digital, I think we all have to be focused on doing this. I had somebody on my team four years ago. I used to also run employer brand at Unilever, which is really thinking about not your products and services, but your company. How do we great, mm. get great women like you to work for Unilever? So how do you position the Unilever brand? And she actually started teaching me about LinkedIn. I had just had like a profile pickup and my sort of resume. That was it. Yeah. And I am just somebody who loves to write and storytell. I do. It's something I've been doing since I was a young child. I just enjoy writing. So when Sarah had reached out to me about um, being a contributor for Unleash. It was a dream come true. It wasn't that, but everybody has their strengths. For me, I'm not Martha Stewart. I'm not very good at cooking, but I love writing. So you have to just think about what you're good at. So I would say to you that when you think about your, let's start with the personal brand piece, and then I can ask any follow-up questions for the business piece, is that I, be very intentional online. And what do I mean by that? I'm not really on Facebook. I have two Instagram accounts. I have one that's public that a friend coached me, girlfriends are great, to create two years ago or a year ago. And I have one that's private that's just of my children, right? So I give that example that if you have something you're passionate about, strong political views, that's great, but making sure you're keeping those two things separate, right? LinkedIn is not Facebook. LinkedIn is not to be sharing your... Um, you know, the, the, the party you went to, or, mm. um, I don't holidays, know. Yeah. holidays, that that's Instagram, right? Yeah. I also have a Twitter account. So I am primarily focused on LinkedIn, but what I would say is it hasn't happened overnight. It's been the course of four years. I mm. would start posting and sharing articles that I had read that people had written and sort of my thoughts, right? I would then also comment on other people's posted postings, you know, one of the things I think women are really, um, really uncomfortable, I, I should say the women I know, I don't want to generalize, self-promotion, what you were saying, Sarah, we're being perceived as bragging. I love to lift other women up. So think about how you can share each other's accomplishments. And, you know, I think it's not, LinkedIn is not for, I think you should be proud about the things you're doing, but it's not for that every day. So I do now, I'm more attentional, like on the weekends, I do enjoy writing, if I have articles, it's not that complicated. I just save them in my phone and I'll just sort of post some of my thoughts and do it a few times a week, right? And so that would be my advice for all of you. Uh, and I would say um, it just takes time. I actually was really, really shocked. Speaking about a humble brag, two weeks ago, <laughs> I was named one of the top voices for LinkedIn and marketing. And I was like, what? They give these awards? I said to my husband, I'm like, see all the time you think I'm wasting on LinkedIn. They give awards for this stuff. But one of the premise of the awards was that they don't want people who are self-promoting all the time. It right. is about people who are writing their opinions, their articles, they're, they're lifting each other up, they're commenting. And so if I can do it, anyone can do it because I don't have anybody running my account. I do it myself and I enjoy it. So I would just say, think about baby steps. The other piece of advice I would give is like, what do you want to be known for? What are your three words? And including them in your profile. Like I want to be known as a storyteller. I want to be known as an inclusion champion. You know, what are those three things? And then really sort of finding content and articles that resonate around that. Oh, that's really Fantastic. that's really inspiring. Yeah. Now, Leslie, I see Samina has a question. Was that posted to you in your personal chat? No, um, she hasn't asked the question yet. I asked her to okay. to speak up. Now, this is as we are kind of slowly coming towards the end of the session. Just as a as a reminder for everyone, this is your chance also to ask your personal questions that Mita will be is willing to to respond to. So take advantage of that opportunity. Um, in the meantime, should we perhaps we we will like chat another five minutes and then you can also ask your questions um, orally. Um, now, I, if, if I may, Leslie, I, I had one uh, other question also to, to mm -hmm. meet. Um, 
because you were also talking about the fact that you are also still nervous at times, Mita. You are, although you have so much professional experience, um, it's it's not that you would just go into the room if it's uh, if you're speaking in front of many thousand people and and are not nervous. I wonder then how do you deal even after so many years with this kind of nervousness? Um, mm. Are there any special tricks? Do you do you practice beforehand? Um, do you just tell yourself this is normal? I need it. Um, Are there any special personal meta tricks that you would be able to share with us tonight? Listen, I told you all, I'm not an athlete. I am a runner, but it is like an, being an athlete. You have to practice. So even as I showed up this morning, I've been doing this for so long and I've been lucky during the pandemic. I've been speaking a lot. It's been easy because no one's traveling. But even this mm. morning, I got up early and I just went back through our notes of a conversation we had a few weeks ago, thinking about how I wanted to show up today and what I wanted to share with all of you. And so it's preparation. I go back to who I was 10 years ago. Ask my husband, he would hear me practicing um, in the shower, in an empty room, on the way to work. And practicing, I mean, if you're going to show up and present to somebody or a group, even in a Zoom format, right? Let's, let's do the, let's focus on online, but what are the points you're gonna share? Are you ready to look into the camera? Do you have your deck ready? Is the digital, have you sorted out all the technical difficulties, right? And just practicing mm -hmm. the things that you want to get across. And also, I used to be back in the day when I would practice, it would almost be robotic. I would practice so much. I would have like, da, 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 let me get through these 10 <laughs> slides. And that's not how corporate America works because likely yeah. you'll be interrupted. So then you're like, take a breath. Oh, they, they, they're laughing. Pause for the laugh. Something you said was funny. Don't keep talking, right? So it gets to the point of like, know the material well because you're comfortable and confident, but then also make sure that you are ready to pause and react naturally and take questions. And the other piece of advice is if a senior leader asks you a question and you don't know the answer to it, all you have to say is great question. Here's what I think. Let me get back to you by end of day with the exact numbers. So I think oh. that's also tripped me off in my tripped me up in my career a lot. Nobody's mm -hmm. here to trick. Like when you're presenting to your CEO, they're not here to like gotcha. Like that's not <laughs> they, they want you to succeed because if you succeed, the company succeeds. This isn't Shark Tank, right? I love Shark Tank. Like, yeah. Like, think about that. Just just say like they also people want to know how you think on your feet. So if um, Leslie asked me a question and I'm just like. I have no idea. Like, right. okay, you have some idea. You might not yeah. know the exact volume of lip gloss we sold to Walmart. I'm making that up, mm -hmm. that's the question. You might have approximate estimate, right? And you might use that as an opportunity to say, oh yes, I believe this is the estimate. And I forgot to mention, we're in talks with Walmart next year. We have another big opportunity coming up that I'll email you about. So also to pivot, pivot and make it as a positive. So practice, mm -hmm practice, practice. The story I have is I'm seven weeks in. Last week, I was asked to record a video with my CEO and two other individuals. I will tell you, I practiced that script for at least an hour plus, hour and a half. No one knows that. I was using my iPhone myself. It was practicing. And so then when we did it, literally, literally, it was only two minutes I had to speak, literally. And afterwards, the chief of staff emails me and says, you were so amazing. You were so natural. I took notes. And I said to her, yeah, you have no idea how long I practiced. That. <laughs> That's okay. That's the end output, right? But people yeah. just, maybe some people do. I'm not one of those people, right? It takes practice, maybe less mm -hmm. practice over the years, but you have to practice. Right. I think that's amazing because then you, you crack that myth that a lot, a lot of this is just talent. That it's just something you're you're born with. Um, whereas like it, yeah, it's it is often for a lot of people, include myself included, that it is something you have to constantly work at. Uh, and it's a skill you continue to develop in your life and to keep sharpening it. Uh, which gives us all a lot of hope in terms maybe of like putting our own brands maybe out there. Some people who are natural at it. I'm sure there are. I'm just not one of them. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, and, and but I do to um I think Sarah made this point earlier. I, I do enjoy getting um, energy from crowds. I think that helps a lot. 
when you're sitting in the sit, you're presenting mm -hmm. and somebody in the front row, you know, is your champion, you're looking at them. All of that has changed. So now it's just that I can see most of you. And sometimes I'm in meetings where I've presented to thousands of people and I can't see anybody. So I just keep continuing to bring myself that energy. I'm smiling, I'm engaged, I'm excited. And, and that's what you have to do too, because I think a lot of in the real world, we would get, this is the real world, but you know what I mean? In live, yeah. you get the energy yeah. from people mm -hmm. and you don't anymore. And so now you have to create that energy and it takes, and it, and it can be draining, but you've got to prepare for that. You got to show up you got to, you got to fight for yourself. And yeah, yeah. exactly. Very now exactly. we just got the question, which I personally very much identify with. Um, mm -hmm. Buddha is asking, she um, and she has difficulties prioritizing um, the time promoting herself um, versus uh, balancing work, being with family life, um, spending time on LinkedIn, social media, etc. And the same for me, I very often think, oh, I, I, I have a thought on something, I want to write an article, uh, but really it's time consuming, right? In the end, networking, be it online or in the physical world, and social media is you could say it's like a second job if you want to do it really really well right um how do you then decide Mita how much time you actually spend on writing these articles or posting something how much time do you invest do you say hey I have half an hour every morning and that's it or is it more like you you care for example very much about a specific topic and then you also spend two hours on it no it's a great question I can tell you what I do because everyone needs to figure out what's right for their schedule and what they're balancing. Mm -hmm. But if you really care about something, you're going to make the time. So if personal branding is important to you and your professional development is important to you and you want to make it a priority in 2021, you will make time. Do I need to be binge watching, binge watching Crown? Right? Do I need to be binge watching all these things on Netflix or need to be drinking every other night? This was me at the beginning of the pandemic, right? I was like, don't invite me to another virtual happy hour. I woke up on Tuesdays with a hangover, right? Because I was, but it was, you know, I wasn't prioritizing. And so all of a sudden, you know, I don't need to be watching all these shows, right? I don't need to be joining every happy hour. I need to be thinking about like where I want to show up intentionally. And so, my priority right now is like my work, family and writing. Those are the three things I'm focused on. And so I don't, so I think that you all have to figure out for yourself what your priorities are. And I, I know it's easier said than done. I've got two young children as well. So I'm not trying to be flip about it, but I'm also trying to ask yourself, where are you spending your time? Mm -hmm. Because if you, if there's that article you want to write, what's stopping you? What was stopping me was imposter syndrome. For years, I would look at Harvard Business Review and be like, gosh, I wish I could write for Harvard Business Review. I could write an article like that. And I never did it. And finally, the pandemic happened. I did it. And I've published three in Harvard Business Review articles. It didn't happen overnight, though. I got rejected a bunch. I've been writing for years, right? And so now those, those things, there's like a tipping point. But it's not like all of a sudden, I started writing for Harvard Business Review. No way. But again, for me, writing was a lot of practice as well. That's so incredible and inspiring to hear from you because I think we all kind of look at you that way. Like, how does she do it? She's just so amazing. Like, she's published by Harvard. Um, but to hear you talk about it, it's like, oh, it really is a process. You do have to put in that hard work and it's, it doesn't happen just overnight. Um, it and doesn't. Don't, now don't... it's like all of a sudden I'm important because I'm there. But two years ago, <laughs> I was just like, you know, I started by writing back to if you're interested in writing articles, I started by publishing on LinkedIn just on their blog posts, you know, mm. their functionality. I did that yeah. for a while. Um, I then had um, Fairy Godboss, which is a, a platform. It's like, like Glassdoor for women. They started to let me contribute for free. And then you should all check out Sway. I'm a, I'm a columnist for Sway. I have a please don't ask me series, but S-W-A-A-Y.com. <laughs> That's more of my tongue in cheek. It's the opposite of Harvard Business Review, but you can actually sign up and there is a fee you pay for the year, but they have editors and publisher. They have editors who will work with you. Anybody can write. And so you could publish a piece and they'll help you edit it and post it. And that's part of the fee you pay, but it's a great, it's a great community. So there's, mm -hmm. if you want to write, there's lots of ways to start. And so I share that because I've just been writing for the last four years with intention. And as I kept writing, I got calls from other outlets or then other people were interested in publishing me. 
Mm. And do you ever feel the reaction um, of being, uh, for example, of being rejected or negative comments? And I'm asking to build on Samina's question because she's writing that she would like to actually be more active on LinkedIn, but she has the spear of imposter syndrome that you just referred to and um, of saying something wrong. Particularly, I guess we are also talking about here, she says she knows a lot about China and Taiwan, but perhaps then things in, in the Western world might work differently and um, um, things that you write could be perceived differently in different parts of the world, so to say. Yeah, sure. To how to deal with this fear of getting negative feedback? Yeah, I think a mentor once told me, once you share, if you share your story, no one can question your story. So you might not like what I shared today on this talk, but it's my story. I mean, there's, I can't rewrite, I'm re, our stories are constantly being rewritten, but things that have happened to me have happened to me. So it is what it is. So I think that people respect you when you tell your story. They might not agree with you, but they respect you. So think about that way, number one. Number two, if I am ever writing something controversial or very thought provoking or edgy, I might have mm -hmm. a friend. My husband's not as useful. He is, he tries to be, but I usually have a girlfriend, girlfriend, read it and say, what do you think? Tell me. And they'll say like, here's what I like. And here's what you could do better. Go to the people you trust. And I think the third thing is just go for it and start, you know, I'm happy to connect with anyone on LinkedIn. Please, you know, follow me, send me text, you know, message me afterwards, but just start looking at what I post, start watching what other people are posting And it could be as easy as you start, here's an article I read and here are my three key takeaways. What did you think about this one? And start that way. Because you have to start somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. How do you manage that anxiety? Um, if you ever have felt any anxiety of like, I've made the first step, so I've made my first post, but every time that I, I want to publish something new, I still have anxiety around it. How, how, do, you, how do you manage that? Is it also about practice? Or is there a more like positive self-talk that you give yourself that this is a process and you're going to get better at it? Yeah, I think it's both. It's positive self-talk. It's like, okay, <laughs> if I'm the only one that reads it, that's fine. You have to also think about like, why are you doing it? What are your intentions? Honestly, I share my voice. So I hope it helps somebody else. That's, that's why mm. I do it. And I also share it because I find it cathartic and I enjoy it. It's not more than that. You know, I'm not sharing it to get a LinkedIn voice award. It was amazing that I did, but if that word award didn't exist, I would still do it. So think about like why you're doing it. You're doing it to help somebody. You're doing it for your own enjoyment. Then I think it sort of changes. And I think back to Sarah's quite other question on social media trolls. Social media trolls are everywhere. There are going to be people, I wrote this piece, gosh, I wrote this piece two years ago now on a platform on Medium called Zora, really for women of color. And it was called, please don't ask me to help you put on a sari. And the premise of the article was that being born and raised here in the US, um, I love wearing a sari. I don't know how to do it. I actually don't know how to put on a sari, which is ridiculous because I could just watch YouTube and I just never have done it. So I always have my mom and aunties and girlfriends help me put on a sari whenever we go out. But I had an ins I've had instance instances at work where white colleagues have come up to me and said, and some white colleagues that I don't know have said to me, I have the volley party I'm going to, will you help me put on a sari? Or I am, you know, we have this event at work today, I'm going to bring in my sari, would you help me put it on? I'm like, why would I know how to put on a sari? And so anyways, that was the piece. It wasn't that I hate saris. It wasn't that I hate my culture. Oh my God, to this day. The comments on, oh God, the comments on that article were some really, really mean and hurtful comments. And really, I would say even nasty comments. Mm -hmm. And I was like horrified. I also had a number of white supremacists, self-identified white supremacists posting on this. And my friend was like, you've got to take your photo off of Medium. Like, oh this is gosh. ridiculous. But it's, but you know, I, I just... You get past it. That actually stung me for a while, I would say. That paralyzed me for a while. But I was like, listen, I, I know what my intentions are. I know what my truth was. If people want to misinterpret it, that's, it is what it is. Oh, I just had that flashback. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> It's slowly uh, coming to the end. I'm conscious oh, of the wow. time. 
And let's yeah. see, I don't know about you, I'm just looking at my, my notes here and um, I'm just kind of going through what, what we talked about today and what we learned. Like one of my personal takeaways is um, don't let negative experiences in your life hold you back. You can develop confidence and change at, at any time. And what always helps, as I heard from you, Mita, is surround yourself by people that speak speak to you, encourage you, um, be mentors or friends or advisors, um, and always be intentional about finding a voice, both in the physical and in the virtual world. In the physical mm -hmm. world, it means to really sit at a table, raise your, your hand, ask questions, comment on things so people see and hear you. And in the virtual world, world, you should do the same just through other means. I mean, you can also raise your hand with MS Teams, <laughs> as we heard, um, or, or comment, but don't just put um, the click the mute button as people then easily forget about you. And also there are other ways of finding your voice, like writing articles, how this is how we found you, um, commenting on LinkedIn. But then I guess there's also a, a takeaway for me, um, choose carefully um, between the different channels that are out there. You don't post the same on Instagram as on LinkedIn, as on Facebook, um, or also WeChat here in China. Um, and then also uh, prioritize, as I heard, as I heard in the end, um, you, we all have very busy lives, right? We have a family. Mm -hmm. um, you say for you, it's um, writing articles, uh, doing your job, being there for your family, and you can't do everything and be intentional about how much time you spend on what. Um, and then the last point was uh, be controversial because if you don't share your voice at all, then you, you will not influence anything in the first place, right? I don't know, Leslie, yeah. if you have any further. I totally, there. totally agree. I think the only last thing I would like to add um, is that Although Mita, we didn't really discuss this in depth, but it was something that I really gained out of this conversation is the power of being and willing to be vulnerable. So I think that I, I really appreciate you sharing all these stories about um, facing being bullied growing up and how that had kind of influenced your own life. Um, and then the importance of just being willing to be vulnerable in storytelling and sharing your own story in the hopes that it could help other people. Uh, I think there's more power in that that we often recognize, uh, especially as women, um, and that we all have something unique to share, even if we don't always feel like uh, we're valuable in that way. So I think always like leaning in to, to that vulnerability, but also being willing to speak up and, and share who you are. I think that's, that's a big takeaway. And I, I hope everyone else kind of can, can remember that as well. You want to be in a place that you're celebrated, not tolerated people. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, that was an amazing summary. The only thing I'd add is I would tell myself if I could go back to my 20 year old self is to say, do it afraid. I spent too yeah. much of my life being afraid early on of like, what people would think and should I do this and should I try this and that's mm. what I have raising my children to be kind and courageous just do it afraid and thank you so much for having me I'm happy to come back in 2021 and do a session on LinkedIn or storytelling and provide tips and tricks and see you all there on LinkedIn and if yeah. you want to read more about Mita also uh, get our book which we publish early next year she will be featured in there and share more personal stories and in just a second I'll also post our our uh, website where you can also pre-order it and we talk a lot about confidence building and overcoming uh, perfectionism and these kind of networking points um, and let's cool. you uh, I, you can also share your we, you will also share your yeah. details here yeah, absolutely. So if any of you, um, if you're interested in joining Beijing Women's Network, you're all welcomed. Uh, feel free to add me on WeChat. Um, I can pull you into one of our groups um, and can stay updated with me. And here's also my email as well, in case you have any questions. Perfect. Now, unless there are any last questions, any last comments, thanks so much uh, from my side, at least uh, to Mita and all the others here uh, for sharing your stories, your comments, and um, yeah, sharing this, this hour together. And we hope to see you um, again soon in another session. Perfect. Thank you all so much. Thank Thanks you so everyone. much, Mita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.